Welcome back everyone to the lecture about applied biomage analysis. This part is about machine learning for pixel and object classification in Elastic. Elastic is a tool which is developed in Anna Kreshok's lab at the EMBL in Heidelberg. The main developer these days is Dominic Kudra. And they kind of try to bring machine learning to people who do not want to script and code everything in very detail, which is quite common in machine learning, unfortunately. Elastic aims, and that's what they also claim on their website, um, that you don't have to have super uh, sophisticated knowledge about machine learning and coding and everything available. You can just use this tool in a similar way as I just showed it in Fiji, but also in a much more sophisticated way. If you want to dig deeper or very deep into Elastic, is and they have a website with really like a lot of uh, user documentation and really there's a lot of material available there and they have a youtube channel where you can see for for any kind of different things you can do with elastic you find a lot of videos where, where somebody did it and explains a bit more in detail what, what he or she is doing so i will just give a rough overview through a workflow for pixel and object classification and there's a lot more material available on that the installation is actually pretty straightforward Sometimes I read messages like this, and so that means something with the certificate is not right, and I'm not sure if my computer is the problem or if the software is the problem. So you see that sometimes with research software or with software in general. The only thing I wanted to mention here, if you see such a message it, which tells you that something is unsafe and Windows is kind of alarming around, please make sure that you download it and read it from a trustworthy source. If you got the program from a website where you not sure who is actually maintaining this website or where this stuff is from, be a bit careful. If you know that this is from Anna Kreshuk's lab and if you know that um, everything is fine, um, then you can just click on this more info button and on run anyway. So this is how Elastic looks like uh, when you open it and you see already that it has a lot of uh, different options you can do. So you can do pixel classification and you can do pixel and object classification in one shot more or less. This is what, what I will also do now. And I think instead of explaining everything in very detail on slides, um, I will just do it. But you see there are some hints here in the slides if you later go through the material. So this is how Elastic looks like. You have a lot of options you can do. I mean, you start from simple pixel classification and it, at some point you end up uh, with animal tracking or tracking of cells. So it's like really sophisticated workflows in this software. We will do today and also you later on the exercise, a pixel classification and uh, object classification in one workflow together. So we just click on this one and it asks us for where to save a program. Yeah, and I just saved it to a random folder. So now we come to the screen and we can just drag and drop um, example data here into this right area. So I now check uh, these three images. Again, they are from the broad bioimage challenge from some years ago um, and you find also a website in this text file which tells you where you can get more of these files. This is just tiny crops of the original data set so that we can quickly go through. I can actually also zoom in here so it's actually quite convenient to use. Then you see here on top the, the files which were loaded that could be thousands of files right so I'm just looking at one of them now um, and you see here on the left it is actually quite similar to cell profiler. You see the workflow where you have to go through now step by step. The major difference to Cell Profiler is that you cannot easily add new steps here. It's like it's a predefined workflow for this particular project, for this pixel and object classification, as we want to apply it now. And the first step after loading the raw data and going a bit through different files and looking at them. Oh, let me zoom in again. And the next step is feature selection. And when you go in feature selection, see here no features selected so the default is nothing and that actually is not quite nice because the developers of the software force you to think about what features to use while in the other tools I, I showed you earlier there's always something pre-selected and you don't know if the pre-selection is good for your particular data so it's actually nice to spend a moment thinking about what features are good for selecting for, for differentiating these cells from the background so let's see what kind of features it has and it is really like the, the, the feature extraction thingy we talked earlier about uh, four weeks ago. So this is features. So when we now look here, we have different texture, edge, and color intensity features. So with Gaussian smoothing, with different sigmas, so we are actually selecting here the same as in the other tools. We could, for example, say, hmm, 
we do not want to detect objects which are something like one or three pixels large. We are actually looking for big objects which have at least a diameter of five or ten pixels or something like this. So let's rather select um, Gaussian smoothing of a little bit a bigger sigma. Furthermore, if we want to look at edge images, so for example, uh, the Laplacian of Gaussian and the different of Gaussian is kind of edge increasing images, um, we uh, could select them here. Uh, I will just randomly, for example, select these three. And then there is like the texture, the, the Hessian of Gaussian eigenwaves. It's like it's a bit more complicated to explain, but it's kind of directional features which tell us a bit about the gradient of the images. I will not select them today. I mean, the idea is having a minimal set of selected features so that this decision can be made fast, but also a maximal set to have a good segmentation. So <laughs> it's like, that's the trade-off, right? And later on, you can play with these features. Leave some out, leave some, leave some others in. I think one of the exercises is actually exactly about that, finding out if a single feature can do it and what that means if it can do that. Yeah? So I will, for now, just take this selection and uh, the cool thing in Elastic is you can now look at these images which are corresponding to this particular feature. So for example here we have the Gaussian with uh, we have the Gaussian blurred images with different radii. It's the same thing as an image change, just a different user interface pointing you um, to functionality like that. And the Laplacian of Gaussian is kind of edge images here in this case and, and the original. So we can go back to the original before we do the actual annotation. And part of the annotation you find here in the training step. And this is again uh, the same procedure as in the other softwares as well. So we have label one, label two, like class one and class two. Um, and I will now outline here, for example, something inside the cells. And I will outline something outside of the cells. And then afterwards I can click on the live update button here in this case. On some computers when your screen is small you have to move here a scroll bar up and down. I don't have to. And then we click on the live update and we see immediately a result. Yeah. And we could then correct again where it's not where it's not nicely segmented. So for example, you see here, I hope you can see it as well on the screen, there is a yellow area between these cells. So I will add here another blue line. And as soon as I release the mouse key. You can actually see that the selection is immediately updated. You can also see that the segmentation is super rough. Maybe I increase a bit the visibility here. Yeah, you can see that it's it's very unprecise in a, from a spatial point of view. So maybe this has something to do with the feature selection we did earlier. So in order to change the features, we have to turn the live update off. And in order to change the features, for example, adding some more features with a smaller uh, sigma, and to be more precise in space, we select this one. And then I go back to the training step and I turn on the live update again. And you see actually that it became a bit better. Nevertheless, I will still outline here uh, another correction. And you see now at the, as, it's, as it's really becoming good um, with differentiating different cells. And at some point you may draw too far and you may just want to remove another uh, outline and this is how it works like that and you come back to the step before so it's like um, undo redo there's not much more to say about pixel classification it works as in the other softwares as well but the cool thing here is we can actually immediately go forward um, to the feature selection for the uh, object differentiation so this is now the objects we have found in our in our original image and let's for example say okay we want to differentiate roundish cells and post-process, analyze them further in the future. And we want to ignore all the things which are like, maybe that's two or three cells clumped together. Or we want to analyze, for example, the shape for differentiating uh, different objects. And therefore we can here select features. Um, and this is again such a dialogue where you, where you select, now you select the features for the object classification, not the pixel classification anymore. And when we look in here, you find quite some different features and the cool thing is that you can just go through here and you see uh, in, the, in the window down here you see an explanation of what this is i mean um, the mean intensity is quite obvious and minimum and maximum intensity maybe as well but the stuness and the cortosis of the intensity is something one would really want to read a sentence about in order to understand um, what these things mean um, if we are looking for shape there's a category shape and we could now, for example, think about convexity. Yeah. 
and it's the ratio between area of the object and its convex hull. Did you maybe hear about this parameter under a different name? So in image J, this is solidity. Yeah, so that's why it makes sense to read the documentation about these parameters from time to time because in different softwares um, they appear under different names. So what you call solidity in image J is convexity in elastic. And I'm not saying that one or the other term is wrong. Furthermore, maybe we want to also have a look. No, maybe we leave it like that. And now, I mean, I have now selected which features should be taken into account for making a decision of shape. And now, of course, I have to give it some ground truth. I have to tell it now which objects to, to take and which not. So I will, as the label one, I will just annotate some roundish ones. By the way, you can also change the color by double clicking here. For example, we can make this green. And the other one magenta. Yeah. So I annotated some objects in green, which are roundish from my point of view. Um, and I will now annotate some others which are not so roundish. I will now annotate in magenta. Um, and let's see uh, if the live update button uh, already shows us that the annotation was correct. So it's like um, a good starting point. And if I now want to make it even more precise, I can still annotate, for example, those and say, hmm, this is actually a not so roundish one. And I can make corrections here as until I come to the point um, where it works nicely. Well, at some point when we are confident uh, that this particular uh, pixel classification and object classification works nicely, and then we can actually start exporting um, our results. And therefore it might make sense to change a bit the export settings. So for example, if we want to export our data as CSV file, which we can later open in Excel, then we have to do it here in this dialog. And then we can just export all. And you will see that takes a moment, or that can take a moment, let's see. Um, so that was really fast. <laughs> and we can look in these Excel files. Um, and you will see here, first of all, I mean, there is again a lot of measurements. For example, we find here the bounding box. This is where in the image um, the objects um, were located, also the center of mass um, tells you that. And furthermore, it gives you the prediction of if it becomes if it belongs to label one or if it belongs to label two. Uh, also, the size in pixels and also this is kind of the, the typical uh, data you get out of tools like this. Also, Elastic uh, has a scientific publication, so if you use it, please cite it. Then also the the maintainers, the developers here can continue working. Uh, and with that, we come to the exercise for today. So um, I provided some example images in this folder, which is just a crop of the actual example data. I would ask you, I would like to ask you to download um, example images from the Broad BioImage Benchmark Collection from the Broad Institute from their website. So there you have some more bigger images. And to play with uh, trainable vector segmentation in or LabKit in Fiji, up to you. Uh, the goal is not getting a particular segmentation out for a particular image. The goal is that you in your brain <laughs> learn a bit what happens if I select different features and what do I have to outline where and why. So especially the trick of drawing a line between two two cells or close to the border inside or outside of the cells. Please try that out. Positive negative annotations close to the border of objects between objects completely outside and see with the live update for example see how different segmentations come out. It's like, it's for me super hard to explain what's going on. And I bet that when you sit in front of the screen, just doing it, you will understand it by by yourself. Because it's like the brain is actually much better capable of understanding what, what's going on that, than whatever lecturer telling you about what these pixels are doing in the background. So please try it out um, because you can here uh, intuitively learn a lot. Furthermore, when you gain some experience with uh, annotating images and with training classifiers, I would for this particular, for such a particular image from the broad uh, uh, bioimage challenge, I would like to ask you uh, to segment these images just with a Gaussian blur. And if this is possible, if you can train a classifier which can do that, ask yourself, what does that mean? 
So we apply a single Gaussian blur to an image and we get a good segmentation out using machine learning. What are implications behind? Then furthermore, you can also try out this object classification in uh, using CLIJ. You can also do this in Elastic, right? So it's like uh, up to you. Uh, please try different uh, features. Try out different features for classifying these objects. And it's again, not a matter of uh, finding some, some particular result. I mean, you can differentiate small, large and non-round objects and so on. So you can do this. Um, but it's more about learning and understanding what's going on here. If I select shape descriptors for object classification, and if I select, for example, centroid and center of mass for object classification, what is different? What, what happens different here? And why is it doing that in a way as it's doing? So it's like gaining some experience with these tools. I would like to ask you to gain um, experience here. Furthermore, this is something very relevant I would highlight. <laughs> taking some ground truth and taking some segmentation result, could you calculate precision and recall for the algorithm which did this? Yeah, so it's, it's something you should not have the equations in mind, but you should know how to do this with the equations. So think about it. And furthermore, uh, take the data from lecture number three. Uh, that was the rounding asset, right? Lecture number three and four. Uh, take the data, load it into Elastic, and try to uh, train, first of all, a pixel classifier, and afterwards, um, an object classifier for differentiating uh, round and elongated objects. This will result in a bunch of CSV files, and you can, uh, can already go ahead and try to analyze the CSV files and plot the round objects uh, over time, the number of round objects over time. Otherwise, we will do this in the coming weeks because the next steps is actually Python programming and analyzing CSV files and doing statistics on that. So, but therefore we need data. So please generate a lot of CSV files uh, using Elastic uh, for the rounding assay, because this is data we would like to process further in the coming weeks. So this was already the announcement. So we will start with biostatistics. Uh, I mean, we, we did statistics all the time. Yeah, <laughs> Precision recall, that's, that, that's statistics. Um, we will do biostatistics a bit more in detail next week, and I will give you an introduction to Python programming. So we will do the basics first. We will again have a look at conditional statements, for loops, and how to open images and process images. Uh, and then later on, um, we will dive deeper into uh, how to, for example, analyze CSV files and plot the number of round cells over time. And with that, uh, see you in two weeks, because next week is vacation. <laughs> Enjoy! <laughs>